Prime Minister Modi is hoping to shine a spotlight on his country's achievements at the event. Signs around the summit show his face as he aims to highlight his role as a global statesman. And Mr. Modi has been on a campaign to beautify the area. The government has cleared slums and removed stray dogs in preparation for the gathering. It comes as the government seeks to wield its influence in both the G20 and among BRICS countries. Ravi Agrawal is the editor-in-chief at Foreign Policy. He used to serve as CNN's New Delhi Bureau Chief. And he joins me now. Ravi, great to have you on. Um, it is quite an event uh, that we're expecting in New Delhi. Um, look, and there's a lot that that's happening. We're focusing on China. We know why Russian president will not be there. And we see the U.S. president arriving a day early. How important is this G20 summit in the context of what's going on globally on the geopolitical front? It's really important. I mean, look, this is a month of summits. We just had the BRICS summit in South Africa. Uh, the UN General Assembly meetings are coming up in September. And all of this comes amid a uh, very troubled time for multilateralism. The world is more fractured than it's been in three decades, really, with competition between the United States and China ramping up and the world sort of fracturing into blocks, as it were. Even Russia's war in Ukraine, which united so much of Europe, has divided the rest of the world, as we've seen with countries that are unwilling to condemn Russia, and India is among those. The G20 amid all of this is incredibly important because it brings together so many countries, and not only that, it is trying to expand. I think Ivan mentioned this, but if the G20 does end up also including the African Union from next year onwards, making it a much bigger G21 covering a large part of the world, that would make the G20 a much more powerful, more inclusive organization, kind of setting it up against the G7, the BRICS, and other groups that have become more powerful on the global stage, especially the G7. That's one thing. The other thing, uh, as again Ivan alluded to, was debt relief. If the G20 under India's leadership is able uh, to provide uh, more instruments for debt relief for the global south, better interest rates, for example, more money for the World Bank and the IMF to deploy uh, at better lending rates for countries like Nigeria, which spends 90% of its GDP servicing debt, then that would be a huge accomplishment to emerge from this. But yeah. as you pointed so, out, Alini, all of this so, is so a big Ravi, PR exercise for India. Exactly. I mean, and it's fascinating. We had a map up um, that basically shows the G20 uh, membership. You mentioned the African Union. Look, a big, big point of contention here is having more African voices. The map clearly shows South Africa is the only G20 member from the African continent. Um, giving the, the global south a bigger voice, does that amplify the strength of the G20 um, and, and perhaps, you know, do away with the conversation and the fear that the global uh, power axis might be shifting um, dramatically, of course, with what we've been seeing with Russia and Ukraine and, of course, the rise of BRICS? Well, I think the answer is yes and no. Adding the African Union to the G20 would do several things. Uh, there's a moral reason to add the African Union um, because so much of global policy making gets done without including the global south. And India uh, has really made a point to try and become the voice of the global south, self-proclaimed, but still. Uh, and remember, the previous host of the G20 was Indonesia. The next host, the next two hosts are going to be South Africa and Brazil. Um, so there really is a move towards making the G20 more of a voice of the global south. And this is all a piece to that. Um, but the flip side of that, Eleni, as you well know, is that this could end up making the G20 more unwieldy. Uh, you have organizations such as the United Nations, uh, which are riven by paralysis mostly, because there are so many members and none of them agree on anything. And I think that's the other big test we're going to see in the next two days. Analysts have said that we don't expect a final communique, a joint communique to emerge on Sunday. And that's because the French have said that they won't sign one that doesn't strongly condemn Russia for the war in Ukraine. Uh, Russia, of course, is never going to so, sign Ravi uh, that kind of a document. Yeah. So, Ravi, um, very quickly, in terms of China's absence, the, the uh, president of China not attending, I mean, we know that they have friction um, with regards to a border dispute. Um, Chinese president was in South Africa. For BRICS, for example, what are you reading into his absence? Well, 
I think it depends on how much they they thought through how it would be read by the rest of the world. Uh, you know, Xi Jinping has traveled a fair bit this year after not traveling for a while. Um, but two things really strike me. One is uh, China has an unresolved border crisis with India. Uh, this shines a spotlight on that. And that is not good for India. So India is quite upset by that. Maybe China thinks it's getting something out, out of that. But the other thing I think is that this is a missed opportunity in that Xi Jinping doesn't get to meet U.S. President Joe Biden on the sidelines. That's a setback for U.S.-China relations. Um, and it's something that isn't good for the world. Clearly, Xi Jinping has thought through these things. So maybe that's what he wants. Ravi Agrawal, great to have you on. Thank you very much for your insights.